I'm so excited, so excited that we have some really cool folks with us here today to teach us about the U.S. Forest Service Beaver Program. Uh, Henny Youngman is the Chief Pilot and Supervisor for the Eastern Region Beaver Program at the Superior National Forest Seaplane Base here in town. I love telling people I live next to an airport. Um, and we also have Joe Schoolcraft, who's a career bush pilot, and Jeremy Harmon, who's the owner and chief flight instructor of Higher Ground Aviation. If you had a chance to read the Tuesday group email that came out this Sunday, there's a much more elaborate introduction to each of these three gentlemen, but suffice it to say, they are extremely passionate about aviation, and we are honored to be able to learn from them today. So please, let's welcome them. Thanks, Lacey. Uh, hi, everybody. Annie Youngman. Lacey already told you who I am. Sorry. Um, really appreciate the invite to come uh, speak with everyone today. We, uh, we're we we're pretty proud of the program, where it's been, where it's headed, and um, we like to we like to talk about it. So I'm going to try and run through this. There's a lot of um, a lot of pictures. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, a lot of slides, but there's a lot of pictures. So uh, I'm going to try and go at a good pace so we get through it all. But um, I talked to Lacey and we're good with taking questions. So if, if you have questions, uh, just raise your hand um, and I'll try and repeat the question so the folks on the Zoom can hear it and, um, and then we'll go from there. Or you can save them until the end, either one. So um, I am going to start out with one question and it's, it's in the vein of knowing your audience. So are there any former Forest Service pilots in the room. Okay, let's see Wayne Erickson or Pat or Carlos sneak in. That's good because you know, nobody's going to throw up tomatoes and say we're full of crap that we're not telling the truth. So anyway. There you go. <laughs> how, many, how many people rode in a beaver? Yeah, quite a few. Okay, um, this is the standard disclaimer. So this is the three of us knuckleheads in the in the green monkey suit. This is what we think of the program and stuff. So this isn't officially endorsed by anybody in the Forest Service, the Eastern Region, all that kind of stuff. So. Come on. I'm just gonna have you do it, please. Thanks. So here's what we're gonna talk about. Um, this this brief is built from um, a bigger brief that I've given a bunch of times to folks that aren't familiar, aren't familiar. So. We talk about location, we're gonna run through that really quick. We'll talk about the history, what we're currently flying, some of the, the modifications and the configurations in the airplanes, uh, how we're manned down at the seaplane base. Uh, and then the meat of it is you know the operations that we're currently doing and our missions, and then a few other things, and then we'll talk about the future. So next. Okay, next location. So Forest Service is divided into nine regions. We're in region nine, which is the, I think it's the largest, uh, region in the lower 48. It might be the second behind region eight, but I do know that we have the most national forests and national grasslands in the lower 48. So anyway, um, we all know we're in the superior there, 3 million acres. We also do a lot of stuff on the Chippewa and there's where Ely's located next. Um, completely inside the superior, obviously the boundary waters canoe area. Um, everybody here is familiar with that. Next. Um, but you, what you might not be familiar with is uh, this is a, a sectional chart uh, from the FAA, and there's prohibited airspace that overlies all of the boundary waters. So if you just build, this is a build slide. So you got prohibited area 205, <clears throat> excuse me, 204, and then 206. And that was put back in place back in the 60s, I think. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, Essentially, what that says is, is you're not allowed to fly any kind of airplane below 4,000 feet MSL. So if you figure we're at about 1,300-ish feet above sea level, it's about 2,500 feet above ground. So we in the Forest Service and the DNR a little bit are usually the only ones who get permission from the Superior National Forest for a supervisor to fly below 4,000 feet in there. And we don't, we take that very seriously. So when we're out doing fire patrols and stuff, we make sure if we can, we, that we stay above that because we wanna respect people's experience in the in the wilderness and that kind of stuff. So we do go in there for fires, search and rescue, a bunch of different things. And we'll talk about some of that next. Um, I think this is the last one. Everybody's probably familiar with these, but this is a build too. So go ahead and click that. Quetico, uh, obviously right across the border, next. 
Voyagers between International Falls and Crane Lake, and then Isle Royale. So we do stuff with all of those, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, uh, quick history of the program. So back in the late 20s, um, most folks probably know Jaguar was, I think, at least from what I've been told, the largest seaplane base in the lower 48. Uh, so there was a lot of vendors here taking folks out, doing all kinds of different things. Uh, the Forest Service said, you know, we could probably make use of this newfangled thing called the airplane for looking for fires, moving people around. Well, it was really successful. So instead of just going willy nilly, they said, why don't we put some contracts out for folks? Well, they did that in 35. In 38, it got to the point where, you know, the vendors, uh, they're there to make money. So they're not always available when the Forest Service wanted them. So the Forest Service said, maybe we should think about buying our own airplane. And this wasn't just in the Superior, it was kind of across the nation as well. So uh, in 38, we got our first airplane, a uh, Stinson. 1941 began the construction down there uh, on Shagawa, the hangar, the dock, and the ramp. And then from the end of the 30s through the mid 60s, we had a bunch of different airplanes, and I'll show you the list and, and some pictures of those. Uh, 56, we got our first Beaver. How many people, I should ask if you're not that, how many people remember when there weren't Beavers at the seaplane base? Yeah, it's been, so if you do the math, Last November was the 65th anniversary of getting our first airplane. So, so what was that? Those are the original airplanes you still have? Yeah, yeah. and I'll, yeah. I'll talk about that too. Yeah. So uh, 56, we got our first one, 59 the second, 61, they did some work on the hangar, and then 67, we got our third one. So next slide. So here's all the different airplanes we've had. Um, run the range from big ones, small ones, flying boats, all that kind of stuff. You can, if you look at the dates, some of them lasted quite a while. Some of them didn't last very long for various reasons until you get to the beavers and you can tell that they've lasted a long time. So it's basically the perfect airplane for what we do around here. Next. Okay, so I'm gonna run through these pretty quick. That's the first uh, Stinson SR6A. That's I believe what was then the, the public dock, which is uh, east of us there. Um, and you'll notice the canoe out in the mooring ball. I'm going to show you a bunch more pictures because obviously we didn't have the hangar yet. So that's how we stored airplanes. So next, uh, a gentleman named Merle Moultrip with that same airplane in the, in the stunning uh, Errol Flynnish uniform of the Forest Service back then. Uh, Cabot Lake in 1938 with that same airplane. And I'm pretty sure that group has exceeded the size, the size limit for the boundary waters. So, okay, next. Uh, so there's that same airplane, different paint scheme, but it's out on a mooring uh, ball out there in the middle of the, the bay. So basically jump in a boat or canoe, paddle out, put the canoe on the ball, get on the airplane, pump the floats, you know, unhook it, let it drift, start it up and go away. So uh, this is a Cub Coop on a fire patrol mission, a little two-seat airplane. Next. Uh, Nordine Norseman, uh, probably the biggest airplane that we had and, and actually... We got this after they built the hangar, and as you can see, they, they couldn't get it in the hangar. So you can only get the tail and one wing in, and then when you wanted to move it, you had to pull it out and do the other one. So, um, so these are on, you know, most of the airplanes are on floats, and these are what we call straight floats. So basically, just take off and land on the water, and that's it. Well, it doesn't really work that well when you need to get it up out of the water. So these floats actually have these holes in the side of them, and these are called beaching gears. So these big rugged wheels with these brackets on them. So you bring the airplane up into shallow water, you get in the water with those, and you basically plug those into the float, and then you can pull it up with a tractor or a winch or something and get it out of the water. So we use those on the on the Norseman and on the Beaver, and then we, we moved into some carts later on. So next slide. Uh, the Norseman again on the mooring ball and then in a different paint scheme. This is a Republic CB, one of the flying, maybe the only flying boat or flying hull that we had, and uh, this didn't last very long. So that's, you know, one of the few and far between sandy beaches out in the boundary waters, mostly a lot of rocks. And those airplanes don't work very good in, in rocky areas because you get holes poked in them. So next, uh, another Stinson, a different kind. I don't think this is a Forest Service airplane, but if you look on there, they're strapping canoes on either side, which is a pretty impressive maneuver for that airplane with that engine in it. So uh, this is the Forest Service uh, Stinson at the pier there. Next. Um, the Norseman in the middle with two Stinsons, so on three mooring balls out there, kind of impressive picture. Uh, this was a Cessna 180, the first airplane we put on skis, so those are straight skis, there's no wheels attached on them. Next. Uh, same airplane on floats in a different paint scheme. 
Uh, Cessna 185, so essentially a little bigger brother to the, the Cessna 180. And that's, I think, the first airplane that was in kind of the current paint scheme that we still use. Uh, we got rid of the 185, I'm not sure why, and then went back and got another uh, Cessna 180. Next. We've had a uh, matchup of, of different airplanes. Um, so in that airplane, uh, you've got the, the two Stinsons there in the front, and then that gray one's the Cessna 180, and then the Norseman in the back. Next. And then you've got a, a Stinson here, the 180, and then our first Beaver over on the right. So, okay, so that's uh, that's it for the historical aircraft. What do we fly now? Our fleet of three De Havilland Beavers, greatest airplane ever built. If you if you ask most of us who work here. <laughs> Next, um, so we had talked about the original airplanes. We're we're fairly unique in that the first two airplanes. The Forest Service bought from De Havilland, and they delivered them from their factory in Toronto right to Shagawa, and they've been here their whole lives. So I, I've asked around. De Havilland, the Beaver community, is pretty pretty small, so you can usually get good answers. And I don't know anybody else that still has an original Beaver that's had one owner, no damage, and we have two of them. So uh, this is, I think, this is Milt Nelson. Um, he was a chief pilot back then, and then that's, I don't know, the, the Haviland salesman, delivery pilot, whatever, flew it in. These airplanes didn't even come with wheel gear because they were designed to be on floats. They, they bought them afterwards. But, so next. Uh, this is really hard to read, but I found this when I was digging through the files. This is the original quote or bill of sale from that airplane. And if you look down at the bottom, uh, $73,450 roughly. So if we could buy beavers on floats for that today, they were still making them, we, we'd have about a dozen of them here. To buy that airplane today is easily in excess of half a million dollars and up, depending on the condition. Of it. So, um, and that's one of the things we'll talk about a little bit later, but we really like to say that these are your airplanes, the taxpayers' airplanes. And if you wanna see a good return on your tax dollar investment, come down to the seaplane base and you'll see it. Next. Okay, so Beaver one we got in 56. Uh, it's got about 18,000 hours on it. That's all for that one. Next. Uh, this is Beaver two, probably right about this, this time of year, a couple of years ago, waiting for the ice to go out. Um, 59, 21,000 or so hours. This is, this for some reason is always kind of our workhorse airplane. We always fly this more. It's, it's usually the most reliable one. Go what ahead. What makes a Beaver a Beaver? What's unique about it? Um, the question was, what, what makes a beaver a beaver and what, why is it unique? So the unique thing about it is when de Havilland came up with the concept for these, it was, it was right at the end of World War II. They had a bunch of military contracts and they were pretty smart. They, they said, you know what, this war thing's winding down. We, we need to figure out how to come up with some new products to stay in business here. Well, what was big in Canada? What is big in Canada? Outdoors, bush flying, I mean, right? So they knew that, that that was probably a niche they could fill. And then they were really smart. Instead of taking a bunch of engineers and locking them in a room and saying, go design a bush plane, they realized those guys don't know what a bush plane is. So they said, why don't we get a bunch of the leading bush pilots from Canada and either, I don't know how they did it, probably sent them a survey in the mail or got them all together, whatever, and said, what do you guys want in a bush plane? And like most pilots, they're not afraid to tell you. And so they came back with a whole bunch of recommendations and De Havilland took it to heart and they put a lot of those in the airplane. And so to this day, nobody's really built an airplane that will do all the things that the Beaver will do. So just some examples are, they originally put a smaller engine on it than the, the 450 horsepower one. And the pilots and the, and the test pilots are like, we need a bigger engine. We, we want to be able to load this thing down with as much as we can put in it and get it off the water. We want to be able to do short takeoff and landing. So if you, you know, you come down and you look at the Beaver, it's got a big, thick wing on it, you know, generates a lot of lift. Um, about the only thing it doesn't do well, is it doesn't go fast because of that wing, but it's not designed to do that. Um, back in the 50s in the bush, how are they moving stuff around? You know, liquids, petroleum, 55 gallon drums, right? If you look on the back door, it's shaped like a, actually, can you go back? Uh, this door right here is shaped like a doghouse, and you're like, well, why is it shaped like that? Well, if you measure it, a 55-gallon drum will slide in standing up like that, or it'll roll in like that. 
with about that much to clear on either side. So that's why they designed that door like that. The inside has a completely flat floor. So you can slide things around. The seats are configurable like that. I mean, it's they're all you know crash worthy. They're they're going to stay in put. But if you need to move one, pull it out of the airplane. You pull a button up and you slide it back and you set it on the dock and you go. So um, just a lot of different things like that. So that's that's kind of what makes a beaver a beaver. Is it's it's designed to fly in the bush and it does it very well. Uh, beaver three next. This one was actually in the army for about ten years. Uh, this actually had dual yokes, so we use this as our training airplane. Uh, and all of the airplanes have dual rudder, rudder pedals, but this is the only one that has dual brakes. So when we're training a new pilot on wheels, this is the only airplane that we'll use. Um, the Forest Service has another Beaver. Uh, it's stationed up in Juneau, Alaska, uh, and this is it a while ago. It's on amphibious floats. The difference is this isn't uh, there isn't really a fire airplane, which is what we do a lot of. This is actually a law enforcement airplane, and so. The law enforcement guys who control this said, well, we don't want to look like a fire airplane. So they decided to next make it this garish green and put a huge law enforcement badge on the tail. So it's it's identifiable, that's for sure. So anyway, but so those are the only four beavers in the forest service. Okay, uh, how we configured in some of the mods. So when we put the airplane on wheels, they're just um, eight and a half by 10. That just tells you the size of them. It's a tailwheel airplane, so it can be a little bit of a, a bit to handle in, in uh, crosswinds and stuff like that. But um, it actually keeps the, the, the prop up off the ground if you're landing off airport and stuff like that. So this is at the Great Minnesota Aviation Gathering back in 2019. We try and go down and support that every year. Uh, it's down in Buffalo. That's a good chance to spread the word. Next. Um, Anytime we got enough ice, we put the airplane on hydraulic wheel skis. And what that means is you can control the position of them. So you can bring the skis all the way up so you can take off on the runway. And then you can put the skis all the way down so you can go land on the snow and the ice. The nice thing is you can actually put them anywhere in between there too. So if there's just a little bit of layer of snow on top of ice, you can put the skis almost all the way down, but leave just a little bit of wheel. And that way you have some brakes so you can you have a little steering. So um, that was uh, that's kind of a money picture with the water tower in the back that um, that Atwell was flying, and I was talking to the USDA photographer, and he's like, "Have him come around again." I just thought oh, that's a great shot, and I'm like, "I think we may be making people mad here." And he's like, "Just one more time, but it turned out pretty good." So, um, and then our kind of our bread and butter is our straight floats, and then the red egg-looking cigar thing, whatever underneath. That's our water bombing tank, and Joe's gonna gonna talk more about that. And that's my lovely wife Jennifer, who was our summer ramper for a while. If you want to hear next, uh, we did have a set of these amphibious floats. So um, these wheels actually, you know, like on an airliner, will go up and go down, so you can take off on the runway land. Um, that's Wayne Erickson. Some of you probably know him. Was over on the first side. Was a longtime pilot here. That's out at uh, Isle Royal on one of the years where they basically had no snow, but just a bunch of glare ice. So they actually could take that airplane out there. Um, we got rid of those because they didn't really work that well with the water bombing tank for, for weight considerations. And they were getting pretty old. It's getting really hard to uh, to get parts for them. So we sloughed them off on the state of Maine and I think they flew them for a while. So anyway, next. Um, these are what the panels looked like um, coming from de Havilland. And we've since done a lot of changes to them. So if you hit the next one, so kind of the, the trend is to go to these glass panel um, kind of video game things. Uh, we've got, uh, I, I remember Dean Lee saying that it, there's an immoral amount of radios in the airplane. So just, you know, sometimes it gets too much, but we, we tend to use them all. So, and the latest thing we've done, which I didn't take a picture of, but these are the engine instruments up here and, and a bunch down here. And we basically got rid of all of those. And we have one box up here that's called an engine monitor. In this configuration, you get to see what's going on in basically two cylinders. And we have nine cylinders on the engine. So you get the cylinder head temperature from one and the exhaust gas, gas temperature from another. So seven cylinders, you kind of, other than what you're hearing, you have no idea what's going on. Well, these engine monitors, you can see all nine cylinders, everything that's going on. You can see trends. It records data. So it's, it's kind of been a game changer for us. So. Next. Okay, a couple more things. I'm going to turn it over to Joe here. 
Um, this was back at the Duluth Air Show, and I put this in so you can see some of the things that these guys are going to talk about. But this is a fish stocking tank that fits inside the airplane. Uh, this is the hopper that connects to that, and then that round piece goes through. There's a camera hatch in the bottom, and I'll show you a picture of it. So that goes through there, and that's what the fish come out. That's a tree seating hopper, goes inside the airplane, has the same thing, goes through that camera hole. There's the water bombing tank, uh, the pickup tube there. And then on the, the far right there, uh, that red barrel, uh, they used to do a uh, para, para drop or cargo dropping, where they would resupply firefighters in the field by putting food, water, gear, whatever in there, put those on the top of the floats, fly over, punch a button, and they would roll off the side with a static line parachute would come up and it would drop up. So we don't do that anymore. I wish we did. It sounds pretty fun. Um, we have a gross weight increase kit on the airplane, which is, you know, they strengthen the wings, they strengthen the tail, and then they put these things out in the wings to give you better control at slow speeds. Mm -hmm. Next. This is the camera hatch. So this picture's a little confusing. It's the same, same thing. So just look at this half first. So you lift this hatch up on the floor and you've got the hole and you've got this handle here with just three little twisty things. You undo those, you grab that handle, you pull that cover out and now you're looking straight down. So that's basically the, the hanger floor that you're looking at. Um, we have what's called automated flight following. And so this is how our dispatch in Grand Rapids knows where we're going. It, and it's completely automatic. When you turn, you fire the airplane up, this fires up and they have this screen and you show up and it says, yep, that's Beaver 192 Zulu and he's taxiing out of Shagawa. And as long as they have that on the screen, all we do is call in and we confirm that they have it and then we don't really have to talk to them again. So it's pretty, pretty nice system. And that works basically all over the country. Next, we do carry satellite phones on all the airplanes. Um, these work really well when we're out in the boundary waters and we have to call back for some reason or, or uh, we can't get radio contact. So. Uh, survival gear, we, we change it for the season. So in, in winter, we got snowshoes and the shovel, and then we'll take that out in the summer. We always carry an axe. We got a big, big bag with a bunch of stuff in there as well. We always carry sleeping bags year round for if people are hypothermic. Next. Okay. How are we manned? So we, we work year round. A lot of people think we're, we're seasonal and we only, because that's when they see us flying the most, but we're actually there uh, year round. We have three full-time pilots, the three of us here. Uh, our full-time A and P or airframe and power plant mechanic, who's also has inspection authorization, which means he can sign off all the work he does. Uh, I'm also an A and P mechanic, so but we all three of them help him. As a matter of fact, those two were out at the airport up until right before this, help him do an inspection on the airplane to get it ready to go. And then just in the last couple of years, we hired a full-time seaplane based manager because before we would all have to pitch in and it would eat into Tim's time and my time for doing other things. So five of us down there and uh, yeah, that's the hangar. Um, I talked about those, those wheels on the airplanes before. These are carts that we've had built um, locally that we use to bring the airplanes in and out. And we could very easily get two airplanes on floats on those two carts in the hangar. So we will do that if we know there's you know bad weather coming, potential hail or whatever. Um, or when we're working on them for inspections. We did confirm this winter, we had, it had been told to us that you could get all three airplanes in there on wheels. And we kind of doubted it because they'd made some configuration changes, but we proved this winter, and I don't have a picture of it, that with one airplane on a cart and the other two on wheels, you can actually get all three of them in there. And it was really nice because we had to do a lot of, a lot of work on, the, on a couple of them and to be able to do it in our hangar where all the tools are and where it's heated as opposed to doing it out at the airport where you have to pay for marginal heat is just not a good thing, so. Next. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe and he's gonna talk about some of our current ops and missions. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, so we're gonna start off. Uh, we do a lot of missions in the Forest Service. We're not only fire, um, so I'll go through it here. So one of our primary missions is gonna be uh, wildland fire. So we do detections where we fly a route along the forest. Uh, we can do suppression where we actually have that tank that Kenny was talking about and uh, find the fire, keep it small until firefighters come in. I mean, come into fire transport where we can take uh, two firefighters, all their gear and a canoe strap onto the side and take them out into the wilderness. And then uh, prescribed burns, we're mainly up there uh, making sure uh, the fire staying where it needs to be, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll talk about that a little later on. Microphone a little bit. Oh, sorry. 
So this is uh, what we call the East Zone Fire Patrol. And uh, as you can see here, this is uh, Ely of Shagwa. And uh, we're gonna go all the way out towards Grand Marais. And actually, sometimes we can come out here uh, to miners and then come back clear and back. That usually takes about two hours, maybe a little longer, depending if we find something. Uh, if there's a lot of fires that day, uh, you know, we can be up for almost three, three and a half hours, depending on uh, how, what's going on for that day. Go to the next one. Uh, so West Zone, uh, this one here is a little bit longer. Uh, it kind of goes through more of populated areas, uh, but it covers the rest of the forest here, um, all the way out toward Cook and then back down. Uh, that one usually takes about two and a half, sometimes three hours, depending on, uh, again, what you find out there. And uh, it really depends. Um, but easy day where you're just motoring along, usually about two and a half hours. Uh, so the water bombing tank, uh, really cool, is developed right here in Ely, uh, 56 and 57. Uh, so one of the really cool things when they're developing it, they didn't want to use the airplane to figure out how to scoop the water up into the tank. And so there was actually someone on a boat that would hang out of the tube outside the boat, and then someone would drive the boat, and they're like, okay, that's a little fuller, that's not. And I mean, you can imagine how fun that is. You're just getting soaked and figuring out how to get the water from the lake up to it too. Uh, so uh, it was developed uh, originally for inside of the airplane, which was kind of cool. Um, but they went through several different configuration changes until they figured out, all right, we want to use our current tank, uh, which is actually an old F-87 uh, fuel tank off of the original fighter jet. Uh, it's suspended underneath the aircraft, as you saw in the pictures, and we'll go on. Uh, I think the next slide is probably it, but uh, so the way it works is there is hinges inside the tank and it's an over center and we have a lever inside the airplane uh, to be able to hold it up into place and over centers and that keeps the doors closed. It's a pretty simple mechanism, but when you look inside, it's pretty confusing looking. Uh, and then from inside, we hit the handle down and that will open up the, the water and it's all gone at once. So we take 125 gallons and it drops instantly. So it's a thousand pounds out of the airplane as soon as we hit that handle. Uh, so the original roll tanks, um, these are, oh, sorry, roll tanks were uh, originally fitted on there. This was before uh, the tank that's under our current tank under here. So roll tanks, this is uh, the early designs, fairly effective. They're only about 45 gallons each in, in, um, in each tank. And it didn't get um, a nice spread. So they decided to go, and here's a nice picture of how those roll tanks worked. Canada used them a lot before they went into uh, the current design. Next one. So this is our current uh, design tank. You can see here, we don't have the pickup tube, but you can see the hole right there uh, where it will connect down here onto the float. Can't quite see it there, but there's a bracket down there that will uh, connect that tube and then there's a collar that goes over it to keep the tube in place. We can go to the next one. Uh, so here's a good picture of the pickup tube and you can see it uh, brackets onto there. So the nice thing about the tube being able to re get removed is we can be flying around. We don't need to be picking up water. Say we're doing another mission, just landing, uh, first and rescue medevac, something like that. And so that drag from that tube is not in the water. So we're actually able to just pull it out and then install it floating in the middle of the lake whenever it is required. So this is the inside of the cockpit here. And this handle here goes straight down. And actually, if you go back to the other picture, we might be able to see it. Yeah, you can see it right there. So that comes directly out. And that's what controls the mechanism inside of the tank there. So we can go back. And like I said earlier, that's an over-centered. So it's just a big plunk. Um, it, you kind of have to use some muscle, but get up in there and then when you're over the fire ready to drop it's just a big smack and uh usually when we're over fires you know you're hyped up having fun by the end of the day you got like a bruise on your hand from hitting that <laughs> uh here's a really cool picture of one of the beavers uh if i remember correctly when we found this picture it's actually just uh, on the other side of the lake here uh, i don't know where the smoke is in this picture but it's a demonstration of the drop um so pretty cool all right, so fire suppression, uh, obviously that's one of our main things we do here. 
Uh, really great picture of how the water spreads out once we drop it. So pretty cool. This is probably one of the most fun missions we do here. Um, it's uh, pretty exciting. If you can imagine you're in this airplane and a fire is happening and you said, yep, uh, Beaver 3, go ahead and put the tube on and start dropping water. So your adrenaline hypes up. You land on the lake, you put your tube on, and now you got to get water from the lake into your tank. And this is where the fun begins. So we get up onto what's called step, where you're just planing across the water, uh, just like a boat would. And that tube, which you can just barely see right there, that is all that pressure. And so there's some drag on the float. You're controlling it. And you basically have to muscle it in the air because you're putting a thousand pounds of water onto the airplane. So once you get it up, then you got to kind of force it up in the air, you're over the water, you get out, now you're aiming towards the smoke. Oh, that's fine. Oh, I think I did that. Uh, and so now you're aiming for it, and uh, it's basically just target, you know, target practice, but in real life. So as soon as you get over the fire, usually there's smoke, debris, and uh, as you're getting over it, you get the lift from the rising hot air and also getting rid of a thousand pounds of water instantly kind of get that the g forces in your stomach uh you know you're flying through the smoke so you're getting kind of that smoke in the cockpit that smell and it's just it's really exciting it's really fun <laughs> that question you know when the tank's full do you have a gauge uh great question um so we can't see it in this picture if, if we come across another picture i'll show you um but out on our wing strut there's actually a mirror and on the tank there's a hole on the top and so when we're skimming across the water, we're looking at that mirror and when it's full, it just comes gushing out. And so when that's when we know everything full forward, as much power as we can without uh, over torquing the motor or anything like that. And then we're up and away. Another question? Yeah, how, how do you target the drop? Do you have a bomb side or seat advance or what? Uh, so the question was, is how do we know when to drop and how do we target? So that is a great question. It's, it's really seat of the pants um and practice so when we're learning how to scoop and drop water we go out and we practice hitting rocks out and like we use burn site all the time there's great rock <laughs> uh and so uh it's kind of different for all of us i think uh of when we know it's just timing so for me when i see that flame that i'm aiming for come right underneath the nose that's when i know when to drop because by the time the speed and you know the momentum and then falls down and also i forgot to mention we're doing this at about 80 miles per hour right above the treetops because we're aiming for about 100 feet above ground level and so our trees around here are pretty tall obviously we don't want anything so we stay above the trees and <laughs> you're going right for it and that's when you hit for me it's usually right as it passes in front of the nose another question below that what the water feel like is it conference or is it by that time doing 80 miles uh so usually it, it can do some damage it would really hurt you we've knocked over trees before dead trees uh with the amount of impact and that also comes with experience if you drop too low the water is going to be uh very dangerous if you drop too high it will actually evaporate before hitting the before hitting it so it's kind of a science and you have to it's all judgment and also it's all training. So firefighters on the ground, hey, that was a great drop. Next time, you know, maybe do a little bit higher so we get a little more rain effect other than instead of pushing the water into the fire and just spreading it. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, so uh, the question was, do we bomb into the wind? And uh, we always try to bomb in the wind, but depending on terrain, smoke column, other aircraft um, sometimes we're unable to but it's best to drop into the wind another question no actually not a question a very quick story oh okay it could, it could be a long story but i'll make it personal <laughs> uh, do you want to have a microphone for him no i my voice projects okay <laughs> in the late 1990s our two in middle school age sons Conducting a scientific experiment ignited our woodshed <laughs> full of dry birch on a windy, hot April day. And one of your beavers came out and, and hit the woodshed 
dead on <laughs> twice <laughs> through the tops of big white pine trees. Wow, that's awesome. Just nailed it twice. So, <laughs> and that that shows how accurate we can be. We can put the water exactly where we want it. <laughs> All right, so let um unfortunately fires do get out of hand, and at that point, our 125 gallon tank doesn't do so well on larger fires. So we move into crew transport. And you can see here uh, a lot of gear. Um, we have two airplanes. This was uh, 21 um, when the Canadian fires are going on. So we have square skirt canoes tied onto the airplane, a whole bunch of gear loaded up into each airplane and then two firefighters each. And we would do this all day, every day. Uh, I think that year we transported over 400 firefighters in the wilderness. <laughs> uh, we can go on to the next one. So uh, this is a great picture um, of back when one of the big project fires happened here. And you can actually see uh, Region 10's fever came down and was helping with crew transport as well as um, anything else they needed for it. It does not have the water bombing tank. So that was just exclusively for our three beavers. Um, so he was mainly doing crew transports. All right, so the prescribed burns, um, I'm sure a lot of you, there's a, a lot of, uh, I just won't even say that, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but anyway, so, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so we reduce the uh, hazardous fuels. So it goes in, it cleans up all the timber litter, uh, it lessens the potential of a really high intense fire, which is obviously not good. That's how we lose homes and, and so on. So it actually can restore the land. So it burns out all that litter. Then you get nice clean growth through. Uh, it can be lit by a drip torch, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a old tin can that's got a tube out of it and you're just dripping the fire along. And another way to do it is out of a helicopter, which that's a, a definitely the cooler way to do it. They have these little ping pong balls basically um, that get shot out of the helicopter and then they um, ignite and they start to fire on the ground. And that's called the red dragon system. Right. So here's a, a good example of uh, what we see when we're over the prescribed burn. So this here is the containment area for the prescribed burn. And you can see the helicopter most likely came here and was dropping, dropping, dropping. Something might have happened here. And then it continues on. And you can see how each ball will start and then spread. So you get that nice even flame front here. And that's what you want to have as it burns off the field. Here's a nice one. This is out in Chippewa. I'm pretty sure the other picture was Chippewa too. So ice is obviously still on. It's a great time to burn. Um, the larger fuels are still wet, uh, but these grasslands are already nice and dry because there's no snow. They will burn off. And you can see probably was lit all along here. Another thing that we do is we keep an eye out on what this column is doing. So if it's near a road, we want to say, hey guys, you know, you might want to get someone out there. This column's falling over onto a road, reducing visibility, which we don't want any accidents because we have a big column and people are driving into really thick fog. Uh, here's another uh, prescribed burn uh, along the lake here. And this is how you can see it's, a nice flame is coming through here, but it's not burning the actual uh, large timber. It's just going along. And uh, this is probably what would be called creeping, uh, creeping along, just burning off all that um, timber litter. Okay. All right, so search and rescue medevac. Uh, this is another mission uh, that can kind of get your senses going, uh, especially because usually someone's hurt. Uh, we do an average of, I don't know, anywhere between 15 and 20 a year. Uh, we have standing agreements with the sheriffs of um, three counties through here, so Lake, uh, St. Louis, and Cook. Uh, we also do uh, some work with the uh, law enforcement. Uh, so if, uh, for example, any gave me is, you know, someone accidentally shot themselves. So the LEs had to go out there, verify it wasn't, you know, someone going out and shooting each other. So, um, and also the LEs will go out last year. Uh, there was a nuisance bear uh, hanging out near a campsite and was getting into 
uh, people's packs and everything like that. So the uh, Forest Service LEOs went out there and they uh, repositioned the bear. So they tranquilized it and they got it moved out. Um, also other things we do with law enforcement is we do custom and border. So occasional say, hey, I think we've had some snow machiners going out and crossing the border. Can you go see if you find any tracks? And then uh, we do uh, do body recoveries as well. Uh, average about one, and that's from drownings, heart attacks, or strokes from you know natural causes. So we do uh, carry law enforcement for that when we do uh, body recoveries. So uh, kind of a cool old picture here. Uh, it's a great example of we can quickly get someone out of the boundary waters to help. So we'll load them from wherever they're at in the boundary waters, get them into the airplane, and then a uh, med medics are gonna be waiting right there, um, ready to go to the hospital or wherever they need to be transferred to. Uh, so search and rescues, uh, they're not the easiest mission uh, because as you can see here, there's nowhere to put the airplane usually. So we have to uh, use our own judgment and figure out, okay, where's some sticks, where's logs, where's rocks? How am I gonna get this airplane to the patient that needs help? And the next picture will actually show, uh, you can see here that a lot of the times um, we have to, we call it putting our tail into the weeds. And so you can see here, these bushes, along the uh, portage here, a lot of times it's on a portage, uh, you know, someone breaks their leg or falls on a rock, uh, splits their head open, whatever. But uh, that is almost more fun for us. Uh, obviously it's a horrible situation, but it's a lot of fun to be able to, how am I gonna get this airplane into these really difficult locations? All right, oh, mission, yep. Um, other than all the fun, you get paid for this, right? <laughs> we do. Surprisingly, we do. Yeah. <laughs> great, great question. Yeah. So the question was, is there any limiting factors uh, to us being able to respond? So uh, prior to every flight like this, um, for example, we'll get a call from our dispatch, say, hey, there's a medevac. Can you do it? And we kind of go through a list. I'm okay. I have enough flight time. Uh, so I'm current to fly. And then I look at the weather. Um, is the weather okay? We can fly. We don't like to do it, but we can fly into as low as one mile and what's clear of clouds. So we like to give ourselves um, that margin of error because that's like someone's life or death. They have to get out right now. Um, and there's also times where we could go out in that and say, way too dangerous and we have to come back. Um, so there is those weather, you know, a big thunderstorm rolls through. I've had this before. There's a thunder, you know, cell right over where the patient was known to be at. And so, A, I can go, but I have to wait for this thunder cell to go through because that's the last thing we want is to get ourselves in a situation where we're then stuck or injured. What about the darkness? How would you prepare uh, yes, so uh, for flying, um, we're allowed to fly 30 minutes before sunrise, and we have to be on the water 30 minutes after sunset. On the water back. On the water back here, yep. Otherwise, we're going to be spending the night out in the wilderness. <laughs> have you ever had to do that? Uh, I have not. Uh, Henny has. <laughs> Do you have electronics on Chagua? Any kind of beacon or anything to assist you with landing? Uh, so the question was, uh, do we have any um, beacon or electronic system to get back into Chagua? And we we do not. So it's all all visual. All right. Yep. We can go to the next one. All right. So uh, oh, we're on to Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy Hartman. Good morning. So a few more current operations and missions that we have. Uh, this one was a while ago, but we have done work with other agencies. Uh, in this situation, the FBI had come up to do either winter survival training, tracking um, in the boundary waters. We were the tax. Next. Forest health flights. Obviously, we work for the Forest Service. We want to make sure the forest is nice and healthy, um, both ours. With these, we do some work for the national parks as well, as well as the state lands. And we'll fly with an observer where 
their sole job is to look out, see what is causing damage. Um, is it insect damage, disease, weather events such as tornadoes or straight line winds? And then they take all of that data, bring it back to the local um, timber rangers, everybody else. Here's what we saw. Here's a plan. How are you going to attack it from here? Next. So this is an example of a forest health flight. Um, we'll go out, we'll fly grid lines, and it's kind of a, a long day of just back and forth, back and forth, have a good podcast or some tunes going. Um, but we'll fly along, you know, a certain transect, get to a certain point. Okay, we're at the end of it, go five miles south, reverse direction, and so on and so forth for however long they need that area looked at. Next. We also do wildlife surveys and telemetry. Um, the last 35 years up until last summer, we we're supporting the USGS with their wolf and deer survey, tracking uh, GPS collared wolves and deer. Uh, we've done beaver surveys in the fall, the primary meal for the wolves. And we've been doing more and more bald eagle surveys, both in the spring and in the fall as well where we'll go out and look for nests. Uh, we've also been doing some stuff in the winter where they're looking for new nests. Um, it's nice when the leaves aren't on the tree, you can look out and say, oh yeah, there it is. Um, and then in the spring, we'll go back and fly around, either look for is you know an adult eagle on the nest, sitting on eggs, have the eagles left, and now we have the juveniles um, on the nest. And that's really fun as well. Somebody used to ask when we would do them, well, how low do you fly those at? It's like, well, I got to be able to see the bird on the nest. <laughs> I'll let you guys decipher from there. Yeah. <laughs> Next. When we were doing the wolf telemetry flights, uh, we did them all year round up until, like I said, last summer. And we would put the antennas out on the wing struts of the aircraft and go ahead next. And then we would fly with a biologist or a wolf tech in the aircraft, and they had this little box in their hand. They would plug their headset into it. They still had their microphone on to talk to us, um, but they couldn't hear anything that we were saying. Um, but they would be listening for the different signals given off by the callers. And it usually was a ping, and it would be start out slow and get, you know, gradually increase in rate. The closer that we got to whatever they were tracking, whether it was a wolf or a deer, and the fun part was we'd be flying along and again, they're, you know, giving hand signals and turn this way, turn that way, you know, do a loop and just different stuff like that. Next. And sometimes it's interesting what you see when you go out and do uh, these survey flights. This is a wolf telemetry flight. There's one right there. Leaves one's right there. Two more over here. And this is either a, a moose or a deer uh, kill that they, that they had out on the lake. Next. A lot of times we'll find them up on the, the northern shore of the lakes, catching the, you know, the best sun for the day. Next. Other times they make it easy and they walk right across the lake. Um, Henny and I were flying earlier this winter and we were actually coming back into land here at the base and look out. Oh, that's a big dog. Oh, there's two big dogs. Oh, those are wolves. <laughs> and I think we counted six wolves right smack out in the middle of the lake. Next. Sometimes they do funny things. They'll walk out. You can see where the wolf laid down right here. Went halfway back, laid down, took a nap. One of the other missions that we do is tree seeding. Um, Henny pointed out the tree seeding hopper earlier in a slide. We'll go back to that in a second as well. Where we're restocking previously cut areas. Um, and a lot of them are, you can't get to them by road. There's no way somebody's going to go in and walk these big uh, 40 acre plots or more, and that's where we come in. So we'll aerially drop the seed in the area, and we're working with somebody on the ground that is standing out there with a radio and a hard hat, and we'll fly over to go to the next one. So this is our uh, the hopper system. It has a little motor on the back and an auger where it goes back out through the large camera hole in the back of the aircraft. It plugs into the auxiliary power for the aircraft. We have a switch up front fly over to the site that we need to be dropping on, get down to altitude and speed configurations. Again, talking to somebody on the ground, they say, okay, yep, you're on target, you're on target, drop. 
we flip the switch on, make a pass. And then again, how we know that we're on target with these is they're standing out there with a hard hat and they're just waiting for <laughs> the seeds bouncing off the helmet. Yep. Okay, we heard the seeds, it's working, you know, continue your runs. Next. And this is a shot from, from the ground as to what it looks like. We also support uh, Minnesota DNR for fisheries. And that goes both with the fish stocking and the lake surveys. Fish stocking will be done in the fall, mostly. I think we do some in the spring. Um, and we can either land and release the fish depending on the size of both the fish and the pond. Um, and if the pond is too small, we stock the fish from the air, which is kind of fun. The lake surveys, we're usually taking two biologists, a square stern canoe and all of their other dunnage and flying them out to do um, surveys of the lake. How are the fisheries doing? And next. So this is a example of a day that we were fish stocking. Uh, we have the big tank that goes inside the airplane. We take all the seats out except for the pilot seat and put the tank, the hopper in, and they will load from the, the trailer. They'll load water into the aircraft so that way they're not shocking the fish with anything new. And then they will, next slide, hand load them by bucket. One uh, nice thing about this stocking setup is at the front of the tank, there is a strap on it where we will put an oxygen bottle. And these little tubes go into each one of the uh, the bays in the tank, one, two, three, four. And then the hopper is also counted as a bay and it provides air while we're flying so the fish you know, stay alive. But they'll go through, they'll weigh all of the buckets and say, yep, here's five pounds of brook trout. Here's five pounds of rainbow trout. Here's, you know, whatever you need for whatever they want. Next. So again, when the lake is big enough and we can land safely and drop the fish out, we land, shut down, drift in the lake, and then go out back, pull the handles on the on the hatches, and the fish just kind of slide out, bounce off the floats, bounce off the water tank, and swim away. But when the lake is too small, we have to uh, airdrop them in, paratrooping brook trout. Um, so we'll fly along, same thing, depending on the size of the lake, terrain, and also the size of the fish. Usually the smaller the fish, the better for when we do the aerial uh, stocking. We'll fly along. It'll usually be a crew of two. Um, this year, Joe and I did a majority of it. And we'll fly along, verify, okay, this is the lake that we are going to. This is the lake they want tanks one and two. Okay, one and two are only going into this lake. And fly along, again, 80 miles an hour, about 100, 100 feet or so. Fly over the lake. Yep, we're over the water, bombs away. I'll go the fish. And that's kind of what it looks like from from the side of the airplane. And they'll hit the water, they'll get a little stunned. And again, you know, the smaller the fish, the better they'll swim off. The eagles like us on these days too, because we're like <laughs> delivery. Uh, when we're doing either firefighter transport or um, the DNR lake surveys, we'll strap the canoe on the side of the floats. And you can kind of see that the airplane is mounted over with everything and the kitchen sink. Next. And then this is all of their gear again, you know, out on, I wouldn't call that a nice sandy beach, but you know, a nice spot that we can drop them off at. They'll go paddle around for a few days, do their survey, and then we'll come back in and pick them up next. And that is everything in the kitchen sink in the aircraft. Um, these are the, the gill nets that they have. And I fortunately have not flown those yet, but they uh, are extremely heavy from everything that I am told. Aerial survey flights, we'll do everything from uh, timber surveys, the forest health flights, land usage, um, flights for realty. If the forest is looking to sell off a parcel to somebody, we'll fly uh, whoever needs to go and take a look at it. And as was mentioned, um, weather damage, blowdowns, microbursts, et cetera. Um, we've also done uh, some flood damage as well, and obviously, you know, post fire damage. Do you?
All right, so we're just about done and just going to talk about a couple other things next. So uh, one of the things that we've done, we just restarted doing the last couple of years is taking the airplane um, and going down to Missouri to the Mark Twain National Forest. Um, their fire season starts a lot earlier than ours and they don't have their own little air force like we have up here. So um, what we've been doing is the first of March, uh, one of us will fly the airplane down and then we'll just rotate pilots down. So all three of us have been down and uh, we're based out of Rolla for the last month. I just brought the airplane back yesterday. It's getting inspection, and then potentially Joe's going to fly it back down for another week or so, depending on what the ice is doing here and what the fires are doing down there. So, um, you know, you saw the you saw the roots around the Superior, um, kind of the big circular ones. Well, the, the Mark Twain is about a third of the size of the Superior, but it's in units, and they're a lot farther apart. So, to get around the whole forest is like a five-hour flight or something like that. You know, we're using a gas stop or something, but it's good, you know, gives us uh, more flying. It, it makes use of the airplane when we normally wouldn't be doing it. So, um, and it helps out the rest of the, the regions. Next. Uh, this is another one that we just restarted um, going out to uh, Isle Royal. Uh, they do a winter study every year, the moose and the wolf out there. And um, we had done this for quite a while back in the day. And then we kind of went down to, two pilots and then one pilot and then two and then one and we kind of realized we probably shouldn't be doing that with just a single pilot because if something happened then there's really nobody who can come out and help you so we finally got healthy for pilots and we started doing this again and essentially what we're doing is we're taking the studies park service people and um uh there's some tribal folks and there's some university folks and they all kind of combine so we basically just meet most of them in Grand Marais or some of them will come here and we basically load them up and fly them out to the island and drop them off. And then once we get everybody out there about once, maybe twice a week, we'll do either a resupply and swap people out. And it goes usually from the middle of January to about the middle of March. So um, this was the first year we did it. That's Joe there in the, in the red. And you can tell it was bitter cold uh, that day. It was nice, but yeah, it was really cold. So um, hopefully we'll keep doing that. We got to have two airplanes to do that. Um, so next, um, we do routinely take an airplane to, uh, EA air venture or Oshkosh as it's better known in uh, the end of July every year. Um, the good part is we get to tell the story. I've given this brief down there. Um, we take those big display boards down. Um, we give away a bunch of smoky swag, all that kind of stuff. The bad part is to do that it's right in the middle of fire season and float season. So we have to pull an airplane in, take the tank off, take the floats off, put wheels on it, fly it down there for a week, come back, reverse it. So um, there's not really any ways around that short of getting an airplane on AMFIB. So next, um, we don't do this anymore, but back in the day um, when we still had those AMFIB floats, um, Dean Lee would take an airplane down to the Navy's test pilot school in uh, Maryland and would give all the student test pilots a ride in that and expose them to the, the float plane environment. So um, something that we just started last year, we signed an agreement with uh, the park service. That's that airplane belongs to Voyagers National Park. They've got rid, they got rid of their pilot position, whole another story in itself, but we signed an agreement that said, we, we can fly the airplane if you train us. So we'll do your flights. And in return, we get to do some flights in it for the forest service so we can put the required numbers of hours on it. So that's actually been a good thing, providing us some more flight time. Um, the stuff we do up there is very similar to what we do down here. So a lot of wildlife surveys, moose, bald eagle, um, law enforcement stuff, uh, ice conditions, uh, border stuff, all that kind of stuff. And that airplane is on amphib floats. So we keep it out at the airport and then it's on wheel skis uh, in the winter. So next. Okay, what does the future hold? So kind of a, a blow up of the region uh, where we're at. So we're obviously up in the Northeast corner. And like I said, we're, we're the only forest service airplanes in region nine. So sometimes people, we used to work for the superior. Now we work for the region, but you would hear some of the other forests complain because they're like, well, why does mother superior get their own little air force? <laughs> else does. So, um, but one of the things that we want to do, go ahead and hit the next, is we actually want to branch out um, to help support the rest of the region. And we've actually done this before. So I just mentioned we were down in Missouri. I've taken the airplane over to Ohio. We've done stuff in Michigan. We've done stuff in 
Wisconsin, and not just for the Forest Service. We've done it for DNR and for uh, some other things as well. So we really want to start doing that. The, the thing we have to do is we have to figure out what people want and what they can use the airplane for, and then does it make sense? So, you know, probably doesn't make sense to take an airplane that flies 100 miles an hour and go all the way over here to the Green Lakes in, in Vermont or something. There's probably a better way to do that. But if we're not super busy and we can do it the other ways and we don't have to contract somebody, we're, we're saving the Forest Service money. So next. Um, so that first one, expanding the use to Region 9, like we talked about. We want to cooperate with the state folks as well. Um, we've talked a little bit about, and we're going to try and do some work on it this year, to actually use the airplane as an aerial ignition platform. So to take that Red Dragon machine that Joe was talking about that dispenses the ping pong balls and mount it inside the airplane and have it dispense the balls out that camera hatch like we do with the fish and the tree seed. And the reason we want to do that is because we want to continue to be relevant, be versatile. The other thing is all of those helicopters that we use for that, we have to contract. So the Forest Service doesn't have its own helicopter. So we don't want to take that mission over because we're never going to do it. But if the helicopters are doing something else and we need to do it here and we can do it, Let's see if we can do it. And the reason we're trying to do it is one of the reasons is because they've been doing it in Australia out of fixed wing airplanes for like 30 or 40 years and it's very successful. So we're going to see if we can make that happen. Another thing that we've talked about doing is try and get some kind of sensing device to put on the airplane, whether it's on a wing strut or mounted under the wing, uh, EO, electric optic or infrared or something um, could be a big help in fires, you know, a lot of the, the firefighting airplanes like the fire boss uh, actually have an IR camera so they can see hot spots and stuff and you can relay it to the guys on the ground. Uh, if we're doing search and rescue and somebody's wandered away and they're, you know, if they're not in a clearing, we're not gonna see them, but guess what? If you've got an IR camera and you can, you know, see their body heat, um, that could that could actually help us out a lot. So, yes, sir. So you see drones in the future, instead of that, so <laughs> the, uh, the question was what about using drones? So the Forest Service uh, and the Department of Interior are both actively using drones and they're they're kind of doing the crawl, walk, run process, which is good because the drone technology is, is changing faster than, than we can keep up with it. So you're going to see more drones doing aerial ignition survey stuff. As far as are they gonna replace demand pilots? I honestly don't think, and I'm not saying this because I'm a pilot, but I honestly don't think there's gonna come a time anywhere in the, the real near future where they completely replace it. And one is because even though the technology is advancing, I don't think it's advancing fast enough to do that. Um, the other thing is like when they do prescribed burns, they're, they're limited to line of sight. So the operator has to be able to see it. I think they've got some waivers now to do that, but even then you're not gonna be, if you're gonna do a 2000 acre burn and you're gonna do it with a little you know, UAV, you're probably gonna be able to do it as fast as with a beaver going hundred miles an hour, just running a line down and getting stuff going. You know, So I think it's, there, we're gonna work them in. The other big issue with drones is integrating them into the airspace so that we're not running into each other. So as a side note to that, when we're on a fire, this isn't us here, this is across the country. If anybody in the air on the ground spots a drone, everybody goes away and they don't fly again on the fire until they find out who's controlling the drone and they get it on the ground and they make sure it's not gonna go up again. So if you know, you know, like your grandkids have one and they wanna go out when there's a fire, probably tell them not to do that because one, there's potential that we could hit it with the airplane, which wouldn't be good, but two, the fire is just gonna go and we're not gonna be able to do anything on it. So it's a good question. Uh, okay, so, oh, I'm sorry, yes, sir. <laughs> actually, can you can you get out of there quick? I, I actually have this slide and I, I hit it, but I'll, I'll bring it up. So basically, there's an hour requirement. You need 1,500 hours. And this isn't just for us. This is for any kind of government pilot job. 1,500 hours of total time. You have to have a commercial pilot certificate or higher. You have to have an instrument rating. Um, we are actually 
for the beaver program, we have to have the most qualifications out of anybody to get hired because we have to have all of that stuff and you have to have a float rating and you have to have a tailwheel endorsement. And you, we really like to see that people have ski time. And so when we get, you know, we, we get a lot of interest in the program, which is good. The other thing is there's, a, there's an age limit and that really hurts us. So to make a long story short, fire, firefighters are under a separate, firefighters and law enforcement are in a separate uh, federal retirement system. They get, they put more in, they get more in retirement. Well, part of that is you have to retire at the age of 57. Not retire completely, but you can't do one of those jobs. So in order to be vested in that system, you have to put 20 years in. So if you roll that back, you have to start in your position by the time you're 37. So if you apply that to our situation, you've got a cap of 37 years old. And, and then we say, we, we really want to see somebody who's got like 500 hours of float plane time and has worked an airplane like a, a part 135 operator a charter or something like that. Well, there's not a lot of people who go do that as young people, right? There's a lot of people who do it eventually, whatever. But so you got this lower thing where you got to get people up to the flight time limits and then you got this age 37. So what you get is it, there's a very slim window. And we've talked about, you know, maybe doing away with uh, trying to do away or get a waiver to the 30, age 37. Because we get a lot of like, you know, pilots from Alaska who have a ton of low plane time and they're, you know, 50, 60, whatever. And they're like, I'd, I'd like to come do it just because I think it'd be fun for a couple of years. And we're like, when I get that question, the only thing I can say is, are you a veteran? Because that's the only, the only way you can get a waiver. That's how I got in was like, I got a waiver. I'm saying, if you're not, a, if you're not a veteran and you can't get that waiver, there's nothing we can do. And I, and I really try and be open and honest with people because I don't want people to waste their time doing USA jobs and resumes and all this stuff just to find out that they're not going to get it. So we work really close with, with people because, again, this float plane community is a pretty small community. And that's one of the reasons why we go to Oshkosh, we go to that great Minnesota aviation gathering because we talk to people and we try and talk to young people and we go, you know, this is what you want to do. Here's what you should start doing, get those qualifications, figure out how to go fly, do that kind of stuff. So, yeah. That's perfect. Yes, sir. Talk about pilots aging out. Uh -huh. uh, what is the, the plane? You're <laughs> the beavers. I mean, no, I, there, you see old, truck, old cars on the road. What's the maintenance? What's your prognosis going forward? Uh, so the, the yeah the, the question was you know we've talked about pilots aging um what about the airplanes which are significantly older than any of us here so um and that's a really good question we're we're in the process right now of trying to come up with a game plan for the beavers to see how long we can keep them running we we want to keep them going as long as we can and i think we can keep them going for I'm not going to put a number on, but I think we can keep them going for a good amount of years. And I say that because De Havilland built over 1,600 of these, and there's over a thousand of them still flying, mostly Canada, a lot in Alaska. And there's companies that are dedicated to overhauling the engines, rebuilding the parts, uh, rebuilding systems, new new parts upgrades, that gross weight increase, all that kind of stuff. And so it comes down to money and, and what they're willing to spend to keep them running. And our, our going in, at least my going in position when we talk to my bosses and stuff is people throw out, um, well, why don't you get a turbine airplane? Or why don't you take those radial engines off and put a turbine on those airplanes, which you can do. There's, there's conversions to do that. Um, or get a, get rid of those airplanes and get a fire boss. And so when, when I have people, tell me that it actually depends on whether they they're just asking because they're curious or whether they they're telling me and I've had this happen to you like you need to do that and I'm like well that just tells me you don't you haven't either sat through this brief or you don't really understand our missions because a turbine engine is designed to take off go up high go fast and go to the mark it's not designed to put a canoe on the side go up to 500 feet fly 20 miles that way and do that all day long because you're going to be doing a bunch of cycles on the airplane all that kind of stuff more than you need to know but the cost of one of those airplanes is way more than we could completely redo all three of these airplanes. And we, we've proven that. We've, we've looked at, you know, can we send the airplanes out on a schedule one every year, every other year to someplace that can go take the engine off, 
take everything out of the inside, do a complete inspection. Is, is, there a, is there a speck of corrosion? Get rid of it. You know, is there a little ding in that panel? Drill it out, rivet a new one on, put new paint, put new interior, put a completely overhauled engine, all that, bring them back. We could do all three of those airplanes and have them set for another probably 10 to 15 years for less than the cost of one. You know, a turbine airplane is pushing $2 million. And then when it comes time to overhaul that engine, is ridiculous. You know, to, to overhaul one of our engines is, I think we paid COVID prices of 70 grand or something like that. But so yeah, there, there's a challenge and we're gonna need to, to address it. Um, but I'm really hoping that we can keep them, keep them in business. Cause like I said before, nobody's, a lot of people have tried and nobody has come close to building an airplane that will do what this one will do. And that's, that's, I give credit to the guys in the Forest Service back in the day who looked at this and said, that's the airplane we want and we want to buy them brand new because they're still here and they're still doing the job. I mean, are they sometimes a pain to work on? Yeah, and they're getting more and more so and our mechanics sometimes pulls his hair out, but I think we can keep them, keep them going. So, excellent question. Let's wrap up. Yep. One more, real quick. I heard 80 miles an hour a bunch earlier. What's your stall speed level flight? Uh, if your flaps are up, it's 65-ish, uh, I think. If you put the flaps down, anywhere down to 45, something like that. So yeah, if you put the, if you put any, just a couple cracks of flaps, you can put this thing in a 60 year return all day and just go around and around. So, okay, um, here's my shameless, Shameless sales pitch. We have a brand new logo we never had before. I've got a bunch of stickers and a bunch of magnets up here. If anybody's interested, they're two bucks a piece. They look great with your water bottle, Jeremy. They look great on a water bottle, cars, all kinds of stuff. And then the, the last thing I'll tell you is, you know, I told you we're, we're, we're proud of it and that these are your airplanes. I really mean that. So if you guys haven't been down to the seaplane base and you want to come down, please, Get in touch with us. I've got a bunch of business cards here. I'll give you my number. Just call us first to make sure we're not busy. We've got something else going on, but we really like to give people tours, show them the airplanes, show them what we do, and show show you your airplanes. Because there's not many government places you can go and actually poke around on, on airplanes. So, and that's all I've got. Thanks, sir. We went over. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very good. Very enjoyable. Thank you. Um, why do we have to pull everybody out if some kid has a drone going? Because, I mean, you're talking a drone, aren't they? Well, even, even a drone this big, if we hit it going 100 miles an hour, it hits the engine, oh. it's potentially four and four and hits. Exactly. Or, uh, well, probably the worst. I mean, if it hits the engine and took it out, we're probably going to be able to die somewhere. But one of those things comes through the canopy, and even if it